Good evening. Welcome to the Lion Gates Hall and welcome to the provincial election 2018 Barry Springwater Oro Medante Riding Candidates Debate. This event is organized by the Barry Chamber of Commerce and the Oro Medante Chamber of Commerce in cooperation with Rogers TV and other local media. My name is Dr. Michael Johns and I'm an associate professor and chair of the Department of Political Science with Laurentian University. And it is my privilege to serve as your moderator for tonight's debate. There are eight candidates running for the member of provincial parliament seat representing Barry Springwater Oro Medante. And tonight we are fortunate enough to have six of them with us this evening. The candidates present are in alphabetical order by last name, Keenan Alwyn from the Green Party of Ontario. Doug Downey for the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario. Graham Farber, who's running as an independent. Dan Jensen from the Ontario New Democratic Party. Jeff Kirk from the Ontario Liberal Party. And Darren Roscom from the None of the Above Direct Democracy Party. Thank you all for joining us. We know you are very busy at this time of year. Please note that Mark Mitchell of the Libertarian Party and Michael Tuck, who is running as an independent, were invited but were unable to be with us this evening. With us tonight, besides our audience and the viewers at home, is our panel. Thank you all for coming. They are Chris Owen with the Barry Advance. Give him a wave. Chris Simon. Simon. I just read the things. Uh, uh, Ray Bowes from the BarryToday.com. Greg Grone, president of the Oro Medante Chamber of Commerce. And Patricia Dent, president of the Barry Chamber of Commerce. These panelists will be asking questions on the following topics. Input costs and competitiveness, accountability, debt, deficit, transparency, jobs and trade, red tape, regulation, and policy. Our audience have also submitted written questions. Barry Chamber volunteer Matthew Lund will read the questions and each candidate will have an opportunity to respond. Thank you as well, Matthew. Our volunteers will be as fair as possible when the selecting of audience questions. The format for tonight's discussion is as follows. Each candidate will be allowed an opening remark of two minutes. For each topic, a panelist will ask a question and each candidate will have 45 seconds to respond. We will then have a short open debate on that issue. As open debate implies, this is a free for all for the candidates to discuss the issue at hand. Candidates will not be allocated specific time in the open debate. They are expected to interrupt each other uh, to be heard. That doesn't mean just yell over each other for five minutes. We'll see how that goes. In the open debate, candidates must confine their remarks to the issue that, that is on the floor. After the panel questions and the debate section, we will ask questions submitted from the audience. These questions can be on any topic relevant to provincial politics, and each candidate will have 45 seconds to respond to each question. And finally, each candidate will be allowed two minutes at the end of the program to make closing remarks. For each portion of the debate, where candidates are to speak in order, their names were randomly drawn prior to the event. Each of our candidates have agreed to follow the format and respect the timing to ensure that we get the most uh, information out to the voters. We also expect our on-site audience members to behave respectively throughout the event. Those who do not listen to the moderator throughout will be asked to leave and escorted from the president pre premises from our licensed security officers. I've never had the opportunity to throw anyone out of anything, so. <laughs> um, an additional note, Rogers TV has exclusive filming rights for this evening's event. All other media present are permitted to take still photography only. Attendees are asked to put away and silence their cell phones and as no disruptions will be tolerated. To get started, we will now hear the opening statements from each of the candidates. The order of the remarks was determined by random draw prior to the start of the event. The order will be Ram Ferber, Darren Roskam, Keenan Alwyn, Dan Jansen, Doug Downey, Jeff Kirk. Mr. Ferber, 
Would I, can I have your opening remarks, please? And you have two minutes. Good evening. My name is Ram Faber, and I'm running as an independent candidate in Barrie, Springwater, or Medante. I'm pleading to all eligible voters not to vote for a party. Elect a candidate who knows the people and have their best interests at heart. And that candidate is me, Ram Faber, the most capable and hardworking of all other candidates. Electing any other candidate will be the same inefficient represent representation or less transparency we have had for decades. I, will live, I live in this riding, I own and operate a small recycling and carpet business in this riding and have been contributing to the local economy for over 15 years. I have a plan and the people of Barrie, Springwater or Madante will be a big part of it. I have a very good feeling I will be elected as the first MPP of this new riding, Barrie, Springwater or Madante on June the 7th, on June the 7th, 2018 provincial election. And if it is my calling, I'm fully prepared for it. I have a very good relationship with both Alex Nutel, MP for Barry Springwater or Medante, and Jeff Lehman, Mayor of Barry, and would really appreciate if the people that voted for them could vote for me in this election. Together with their help and the help of all the people in Barry Springwater or Medante, we will make this riding one of the best in Ontario. I'm also looking forward for a larger than normal voters turnout the 60 to 70% of voters that do not bother to vote, please come out and vote for me. Your choice will be heard now more than ever before because I'm doing it for you. Ontario's $312 billion debt is now at the point where every person in the province is 22,000 in debt because of Queen's Park mismanagement and poor budgeting. That is the worst debt per citizen ratio of any province in Canada or state in the United States. Baby boomers are now well into their 60s Thank and you. 70s. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. We will uh, now move to Mr. Roskam. Two minutes. Thank you to the Barry Chamber of Commerce and Rogers for all your work, volunteering your time and expertise to put together this debate, which is the first and probably will be the only completely fair debate which invites everyone, so thanks. And um, furthermore, even though we're all gonna have differing opinions and we'll probably be fighting a little bit before the evening's over, thanks to you all for your, ten for your attendance for this debate because it shows you take a deep interest in what is happening here. My website is darrenroskam.com. The party website for none of the above direct democracy party is nota.ca, that's N-O-T-A.ca. Now, most of you know me for years and years over federal and provincial elections as a libertarian fella. And so the, your question may be, well, what happened? You don't believe in that stuff anymore? You changed your mind? I still believe in all of it. It's just that I had a falling out with the Ontario uh, leader, Alan Small. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a school teacher. It's just if your working career is being uh, a school teacher and you're retired, uh, that's not the best person to be running the Libertarian Party and then saying we need to get the government out of the school business. Furthermore, Alan Small has upheld the candidacy of Alan Detweiler in the riding of Cambridge, and he had things to say about LGBT people which are so sad and horrible I can't repeat them. You have to go to the website to read them there. That goes against the Libertarian belief that you do whatever you want with your life as long as you don't hurt anyone else or try to take away their property or money. So after all that drama, I've got 30 seconds left to tell you about my party. And none of the above is not just a joke. It stands for the Direct Democracy Party. It believes in referendum, reform of our electoral system, and my favorite, recall, which allows you to get rid of a lying politician without having to wait for another election to come around. It's a new party, and uh, I hope I have more opportunity to speak about it and what it has to offer as the evening carries on. Again, thanks for attending, and let's get started. Thank you. Mr. Alwyn. Two minutes. Thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for, for inviting us here this evening. And I'm proud to say that the Green Party is the only party in this riding that uh, is a member of the, the Chamber. So thank you again. And uh, my name is Keenan Aylwin. I'm running to be your MPP in Barrie, Springwater, or Omodante. And I grew up in Barrie. And that's where I got my first taste of politics as a student at Barrie Central Collegiate and earlier Prince of Wales Public School fighting alongside the community to save those schools from closure. But that was also my first taste of disappointment in our political system. The community fought as hard as we could to save those schools, and the decision was made to close them anyway. And that was a huge loss for this community, 
and a major disappointment for those of us involved. And now a few years later, that disappointment in our political system has really grown, and it shows. Last provincial election, fewer than 50% of people in Barrie even cast a ballot. Fewer than 50%. So I'm not sure if I really blame them, because, you know, people are sick, they're fed up with the attacks and the games and the false promises, but, you know, I'm excited, because I've been knocking on doors since September, and what I've been hearing with the thousands of conversations I've had at the door is that people are ready. They're ready for a party that's going to be straight up and honest with people about some of the challenges that we face, but also honest about how to pay for the solutions. So we, we have an opportunity in this riding to make history. And I've been working hard to earn your trust, earn your respect, and ultimately earn your vote on June 7th. So join us, let's make history. Vote Green, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jansen, two minutes. First off, thank you very much for coming out, uh, or for, uh, for everybody for coming out tonight to join us, and thank you to the Chambers uh, for inviting us all here tonight to uh, let people know a little bit more about our platforms. I'm very proud to be running for the NDP, and I, I very much hope to become the MPP uh, for the riding of Barry Springwater or Medante. I grew up in Anton Mills, just a community just north of here, and uh, I lived just down the road on Grove Street. I've been working for 18 years at Air Canada, and about seven years ago I decided to uh, step up for my coworkers, and I started uh, reporting on safety issues in the workplace. I, uh, by reporting on safety issues and seeing that they got properly addressed, I was able to create change. And in such a large workplace, to create even a small change was really empowering. And it's, uh, ultimately, it's led me to where I am, standing here, uh, sitting here uh, in this room with you tonight. Um, and on some of the work that I do, uh, I'm on a Labour Council, a Toronto Airport Workers Council. We represent 30,000 of Pearson's 50,000 workers. And we've been advocating on, uh, on behalf of them to improve our labour conditions and safety culture and uh, working with the airport authority on a shared vision of what our future should look like. Um, so I have experience sitting at a table with both sides and, uh, and making sure that we're working together for a common goal. And that goal is, of course, uh, success uh, for our workplace. So I want to do the exact same here in Barrie Springwater or Medante. I want, to, I want to listen to my community's concerns and bring them forward. And I know that there's not just one side to the story every single time. You need both sides of the story. Um, you listen and you take those voices forward to represent, them at, represent the people at Queen's Park. I hope to bring that passion and my dedication to creating change for the people of Barry Springwater or Medante. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Downey, two minutes. Good evening. I'm Doug, your, your progressive conservative candidate here in Barry Springwater or Medante. I'm from Simcoe County. I lived, worked, and played in this area my entire life. I grew up in Bond Head. I farmed, drove parts trucks roofed, did all the things that we needed to do to, to pay for school. My wife and I settled back here after school and, and uh, we obviously chose it for its lifestyle and for its opportunity. And there are huge challenges that we need to tackle to bring that opportunity to others. My father drove trains for a living and my mom was a nurse before she be became a family counselor. So I do understand what's happening in the hospitals and there's a lot of work to be done there as well. My wife's a special ed teacher uh, dealing with children and she's worked at several schools in the riding, which is another perspective. I'm a real estate lawyer and a small business lawyer. I've dealt with thousands of families of all ages in Simcoe County. So the challenges they have buying a house or raising their children or trying to access services is real to me because I deal with it on a daily basis. I've done about 8,000 transactions for people throughout Simcoe County in the last several years. Our law firm employs 15 people in addition to the lawyers that are there. So I know how hard it is to do business in this province right now. It is very difficult. And I know what it is to see clients struggling and trying to, to make ends meet, deal with government rules and regulations and taxes. And as a small business owner, I turn a key in a door. I know what it's like to stand last in line to get paid. I'm drawn to politics because I believe I can make a difference. I'm past president of Big Brothers Big Sisters, past president of Qantas, past president of a chamber, I sat on a municipal council for a couple of terms, so I understand how that part of government works. I believe people are ready for a change. 
People are frustrated and angry. We've all knocked thousands of doors. We've all heard it. People are ready for positive change. I think I have the experience to bring that positive change. In addition to my time on municipal councils, I've sat on an expert panel on the regulation of home inspectors. I was appointed to an expert panel on business law reform. I've helped advise governments on how Thank to... Thank you. Mr. Kirk, two minutes. Hi, my name is Jeff Kirk. I'd like to thank the Barry Chamber of Commerce for having us here tonight and thank Rogers for uh, filming this event. I am the Liberal candidate for Barry Springwater Oromodonte. As a healthcare worker, I've seen firsthand how investments in pediatric and cardiac care keep patients closer to home. I'm supportive of a diverse economy where everyone can thrive and I want to protect the environment. That means expanding the green belt right here in Simcoe County. Now I get it, things haven't been perfect in Kathleen Wynne's Ontario, but the Liberal Party is the only party with a plan and a track record of investing in the people of Ontario. If you support these values, vote Jeff Kirk. I look forward to debating tonight with these gentlemen and thank you all for being here. Thank you, candidates. We will now move on to a question on our first topic, which is input costs and competitiveness from Patricia Dent. Each candidate will have 45 seconds to answer this question in the following order. Mr. Roskam, Mr. Ferber, Mr. Kirk, Mr. Downey, Mr. Jansen, Mr. Elwin. After that, there will be an, an additional question, at which point we'll open up time for the five minutes of debate. Ms. Dent, your question. Thank you, and thank you, gentlemen, for being here. We're looking forward to this debate. Question one, would your party consider allowing Ontario businesses, particularly energy-intensive businesses, to purchase excess supply before it is sold to outside jurisdictions? Mr. Roskin? Uh, yes, uh, I guess so. In regards to input costs and competitiveness, the, the competitiveness. Sorry, uh, I guess the chief thing that uh, is our stumbling block is the high cost of uh, hydro at the moment, and uh, you know, the, the, the nature of none of the above is that there's uh, a lot of things which are a blank canvas. And so the short answer, with 30 seconds left, would be. I would follow the same thing that uh, Doug Ford is trying to offer. If he could get 12% reduction in hydro rates, or even 10, that would be uh, commendable. And uh, being liberated, for lack of a better word, from the Libertarian Party strictly to what they have to offer, they'd be promising a 50% cut, which is a silly, impossible thing to say. And so, um, uh, yeah, the 10%, 12% seems accurate to myself. Thank you. Mr. Fairber? It is a very good question, and it is something that we need to look into, uh, and it's something I need to discuss with uh, the people of Barry Springwater or Madante. They are my team, and the best answer, I mean, all these candidates could dress up an answer and give it to you, but at the end of the day, after the election, you never hear anything back about these candidates. But uh, competitiveness, if you allow one company to buy excessive uh, energy, it means smaller companies who can't afford that wouldn't be able to compete with the bigger companies and little guys like me, it will just throw small businesses out of business. So it's something that we need to look into. Thank you. Mr. Kirk? Uh, so the ebb and flow of energy, so the supply and demand fluctuates uh, during certain periods of time. And so uh, I would rather see uh, the 25% reduction in energy rates, which the Liberal Party has brought forward, as well as investments in green energy to help reduce the overall costs of uh, the infrastructure. An example would be innovative automations. They invested in their green energy and were able to lower their energy costs through those programs, which are cleaner and safer for our environment. Thank you. Mr. Downey? We have to approach how we deliver hydro and how we sell hydro and how we harness hydro differently. We're spilling half of Niagara Falls. We're not using 50% of the capacity there because of the way that the, the Liberal government has set up the system. It's been in the newspapers. It's 
everybody knows that they've preferred certain suppliers and they've, they've set deals that are not in the interest of the public. So would I allow them to buy it? I would certainly be looking at anything innovative that brings down the cost and allows our manufacturing sector to get back to work. Mr. Jensen. <coughs> well, it's well known that the uh, Liberal government didn't run on a mandate to uh, sell hydro when they, uh, when they ran four years ago, um, and they did, which has increased uh, uh, cost for every single person in the province and every business. Um, I'm, not honest, I'm on, honestly not too sure whether or not uh, we'd be uh, interested in uh, selling the excess supply to, uh, to businesses to store and use later, but I think it's a conversation that should be happening. Uh, especially if they have the need and the, and the ability to do that. Mr. Ellen. So the Green Party of Ontario is the only party that in our comprehensive vision for Ontario, we're calling for excess power that we are selling at a loss to other jurisdictions to be sold to small businesses, but not only businesses, to, to nonprofits as well. Um, because, you know, if we're selling at a loss, we might as well help our communities here in Ontario. But we also need to get to the root of the high cost of hydro. And none of the three big status quo parties are talking about some of the major causes of high energy prices. Um, so shutting down the Pickering nuclear station is something we need to do at the end of this year. It's up for renewal at the end of this year. And the nuclear industry is asking for a 180% price increase, and we have to have the courage to say no to that. Thank you. Thank you. So at this point, we will move on to the five minutes of open debate, beginning with a question uh, from Patricia Dent. Again, this is the spontaneous part of our program for any candidates who wish to comment on this topic. A specific time will not be allocated to each candidate during this five-minute time frame. Ms. Dent, your question? Certainly. This is a little bit of a long one. Are you ready? Bill 148, the Fair Workplaces Better Jobs Act, increased minimum wage from $11.40 to $14 per hour on January 1st this year and will increase it again to $15 in January 2019. In addition, this legislation contained a wide range of changes to employment standards relating to vacation pay, public holiday calculations, personal emergency leave, equal pay, on-call pay, and shift scheduling. Chamber members are struggling with the sheer volume of changes and the associated costs of these changes to their business. What specific actions will your party take to support small businesses during the transition to these new requirements and costs? Well, the first thing we have to do is not increase minimum wage again because we're having businesses close straight out of the gate. Um, we're seeing restaurants reprint their menus to increase the cost of, of doing business eating out. Uh, we're seeing the businesses doing shorter hours, uh, cutting back hours for people. That Bill 148, quite frankly, is a disaster. Um, the, the number of pieces in there and the, the cost of bureaucracy that's embedded in there is very harmful to the businesses. They didn't do proper consultation. As, as somebody that fought for, uh, for the $15 minimum increase, I uh, was on the 15 in Fairness campaign, um, and I fought for three years uh, on behalf of my airport co-workers to have that... Uh, that uh, implemented. Um, it was a benefit to 1.7 million uh, workers in the province. So I, we, I do I, understand though, sorry Gene, and I do understand that uh, it has been complicated for uh, uh, small businesses and I want to say that uh, the NDP offers predictability. So that when, you, when you're getting your, uh, your labour laws uh, updated and uh, we will be consulting with, uh, with small businesses. When the minimum wage does go up, uh, we will be um, uh, announcing it in, uh, with, a, sorry, with a proper plan. Yeah. And we'll be raising it by inflation so, so Dan, year over year. Dan, sir, we, we need to stop. We need to sir, stop. We do not make stop. me have you, have you escorted out of this room. We, we, we need to stop playing wedge politics with I mean, people's we, livelihoods. We have had, because, we have had these because, guys, you know, they have been fighting you know, sorry, for, Ram, for years to make things better in Ontario. But yet it's the worst province in Ontario that... Uh, we have had no growth in this province in, for the last 10 That's years. That's not true. We have four, we are we have four main parties 
Two of them are activists. The Green Party and the NDP Party are activists. And you know what happens when you have demonstration and activists throwing around their... So around. the Green Party of and Ontario we have the Liberal is the party only party who have screwed up the province. We're the only and we party have, and we have calling for a the, balanced The PC approach. party, Doug Downing, Graham, who was uh, nominated by Doug Ford and not the people. How are these guys going to get anything done Thank for you, Ontario? They have tried for decades. Thank you, Ram. And we haven't seen anything. Thank you. So the Green Party of Ontario is the only party calling for a balanced approach because we do need to increase the minimum the Green wage. Party People the party need to afford the Green to pay Party their, is to the party pay their bills to feed their families to put a roof over their head. Ram, Ram more come on. taxes, more cost of living Ram, increase. Can we have a respectful debate, please? Uh, this is an open five minutes debate. But let's be respectful. Thank you. Okay. So, the, uh, so we need to raise the minimum wage, but we also need to lower payroll taxes for small businesses. And I'm sick of the Liberals and the Conservatives and the NDP playing wedge politics with these issues. We can't pit workers against small businesses. We can do both. We can do both. And that's the Green Party of Ontario's policy. They Thank are you. causing havoc in BC right now. They have a gun to the NDP's head and we cannot get the Trans-Canada pipeline through where we're losing billions and billions of dollars and they're putting taxpayers into huge debts. Mm -hmm. This is what the Green Party does. They're activists and they screw everything up. On the, uh, on the issue of uh, increasing the labor legislation and the labor laws, uh, what we were trying to do, or the attempt, is to uh, bring fairness to the workplace. Uh, when your workers are treated fairly and they make a decent living and they, and they can take the time off that they need when they're sick, to take care of their families. They don't have to make decisions on whether to uh, go to work sick or put food on the table. Uh, this helps uh, businesses be healthy. Businesses can thrive when workers are doing well, when they want to be at work. We're talking when... about reducing the burden on small businesses. An example would be lowering the corporate income tax rate from 4.5% to 3.5%. Lowering hydro rates by 25% and eliminating the capital tax rate. But, but this Jeff, is how you Jeff, help Jeff, small Jeff, businesses. But Jeff, this you're on record saying that hydro is affordable and that it is where it should be. And unfortunately, all big three status quo parties support the Liberals' hydro plan, which mm, actually ends up being a tax cut for the rich Absolutely not, because they not use the, the mo uh, most amount of hydro. Well, so we need to cancel that and get to the root of the problem instead of having this expensive Band-Aid. We have seen what the Liberals have done to the province in the last 15 years, so no one needs to, to be yes, reminded of that. Yes, lowered the unemployment to a 17-year low, the leader in G7 in economic growth. We have the lowest corporate tax rate in all of Canada. Yes, we've seen what the Liberal Party's done, and it's great, and we need to continue. Businesses are closing, Jeff. They're closing in our community. People are out of work, and they're shortening hours. They're shortening... Uh, the ability for people to survive and the cost of living is going up, the cost of housing, it, it's, it's, I know the Liberals think they're doing the right thing, but the actual collateral damage is significant. The thing is, you do need a balanced approach and that approach has to be between okay. workers and that, small business. That is five minutes. We may see this issue come back in the questions from the audience. The next topic for our candidates concerns accountability and the panelist for this question is Chris Simon. Got that right now. Uh, each candidate will have 45 seconds to answer this question in the following order. Mr. Ferber, Mr. Elwin, Mr. Jansen, Mr. Roskam, Mr. Downey, Mr. Kirk. Mr. Simon, can I have your question, please? Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to be on this panel today. Um, I'd like to know uh, from each candidate what your plan is to relieve the financial stress faced by Ontario municipalities. Um, there was a recent Globe and Mail column from um, Innisfil Deputy Mayor Lynn Dolan who actually pointed out a multi-billion dollar annual gap between municipal tax revenue and the services that each of these municipalities um, must deliver. Um, please. Mr. Fairwood? Yeah, accountability is a huge, huge issue with all four of the leading parties right now. Uh, we have seen what it has done to, to, to the province. As an independent candidate, what I will do is, I will consult with every business and every person in this riding. My main focus will be in the riding. I'm not gonna be the premier, so my concern is not the province. My concern is the riding and the municipalities that are in my riding, which there are three. Um, 
I will be like an ombudsman in my writing. I will take all information from, from the people and when I'm at Queen's Park, I will bring back whatever is happening at Queen's Park to the people Thank and you. let them know what's happening. Thank you. Mr. Elwin? So one way that we can help municipalities um, carry the burden of, of that lack of tax revenue is, is by shouldering the cost of transit, 50% of the operating cost of transit on the province. Um, and that would be a huge relief for municipalities. But we also need to be upfront and honest with people about how we're gonna pay for these things. So if you look at our fully costed platform online, we're the only party that's not gonna be adding to the deficit in the next few years. We're actually reducing the deficit so that we can pay for these much needed services. Thank you. Mr. Jensen. There's no doubt that municipalities are filling this drain. Um, in talking to some people from actually uh, 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 about the green belt issue, it's about how we're building our communities and, uh, and, um, and where we're building them. Um, so are we building them where there's access to transit, existing uh, infrastructure? Um, we, need, we need to be thinking about those things. So building in a city like Barrie um, makes sense. Uh, the NDP is also putting money towards uh, transit, uh, um, not only the transit that exists, but also transit in infrastructure that cities can grow. And as they grow, they can, uh, they can get people around. Um, to those community centers and, and to their workplaces and, uh, uh, and, and to where they uh, need to visit friends and family. <laughs> Mr. Ruskin. So the paper says uh, accountability, debt, deficit, and transparency, those three subjects I would love to dig into and speak to all three of them. It's just that representing a small party, I feel like the, the three big shot parties that have held power, they've really earned the right to point fingers at each other during the open debate portion. So. If I'm limited just to speaking to, uh, so I don't feel comfortable jumping in there without looking a little silly and grandstanding. So if, if I'm limited to just talking about taking a burden off the municipality, I would just have to keep it short and say, it's just passing the buck and it's a shell game. If you relieve a, a misery in one part, one of the three levels of government, and pass it on to another, well, the debt is the great devil behind all of it and spoils all of our dreams. And if, if, I, if, I, had a, if I always had a big party behind me, I would like to speak to those things during Thank the you. big open thing. Thank you. Mr. Downey. Yeah, there are so many things we can do with municipalities and for municipalities. And, and because it's the same taxpayer, obviously. Uh, I sat on a municipal council. I sat on the Ontario Small Urban Municipalities Board for several years. Uh, Infrastructure needs, if you talk to anybody in Horseshoe Valley, we can talk about the water systems and, and the pieces that are going on there. The growth plan and what's happening in spring water, uh, the Liberals set up a system and then just ignored it and, and decided to do something differently. The official plans that happen, uh, each municipality has to do an official plan every, every five years. We should be doing those on 10-year cycles. That's just administrative cost savings. There, there are a ton of things that we can do with our partners. Thank you. Mr. Kirk. Uh, so I'm going to echo uh, Doug Downey here. I do believe that the key to the solution is through infrastructure changes, and these infrastructure changes are similar to uh, the $230 billion that have been invested in roads, in bridges, in wastewater systems. Right here in Barrie, Springwater, Oro Medonte, we have some serious concerns. Horseshoe has some water concerns, some wastewater concerns that need to be addressed, and I think the province has a role to play in addressing those concerns. Thank you. Thank you. It is that time again for five minutes of open debate, again beginning with a question from Mr. Sun. Okay. Um, what's your party's plan for getting public sector salaries under control? So I'll start off with this. Uh, there are uh, some salaries that uh, I would argue are uh, out of control, um, but the provincial government has put a, uh, a cap, a, a freeze, on a number of salaries. Uh, we've all seen the sunshine list, and the sunshine list uh, seems to be growing year after year after year. And uh, that is uh, an example of how our uh, service sector is increasing and providing additional services to the people here in Ontario. Um, I believe in a fair wage that is based on market rates, and we need to ensure that we're evaluating market rates against other uh, industries. And if those rates are not appropriate, then we need to make adjustments. We need to step in. 
but most of the public salary sectors are large job um, uh, positions. Uh, uh, things like nursing, things like teaching. And these are, are very uh, big components of the services that we provide to Ontario. And uh, again, we need to monitor them, control them, but be very respective in how we deal with that. So the Liberal government solved the, the largest piece, the $6 million man piece, by making it a private sector salary. They sold off the entity. And we need to deal with that. We, we have to set some limits for people who, in, in the public sector, it's, nobody is worth $6 million, $6 million in the public sector. Nobody. And when we, when we talk about comparators across the, across the country, the, the CEO of Hydro-Quebec is only 400000 um, we, we need to be realistic about uh, value for money with the public dollars. Mm -hmm. And you're right about that, Doug. And um, we do need to have an actual fiscal plan to do that. And we're still waiting to see yours, and that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. But we do need to... <laughs> So we do need to tackle the problem of the people at the top in the public sector. I, I was waiting for that, and so I've timed it. We're you're right on cue. That's perfect. Awesome. So here's the thing. We have a plan. We have a plan. What we don't know, we have, we have policies out every second day. What we don't know is how is you're going to pay for what it. what the Liberals have actually done with the books. We all know the books are bad. We, we know that they tried to hide $26 million. I think we need to get back on hydro. topic, uh, guys. We're talking about public service uh, salaries. Uh, public service sector salaries and you know what there's there's millions of workers that work in the public service that do a good job on behalf of this province every single day it's not uh, it's not the vast majority that we're worried about uh, as we were talking about there are some salaries that are under control and the NDP does have uh, uh, plans to make sure that wages do not get out of control um, by privatizing uh, our uh, public entities that's what happens is uh, is these private corporations they want to make profits they want to treat their CEOs to uh, to uh, big packages. Uh, our plan is to make sure that we're keeping public services in public hands where they belong. Uh, the NDP and the Green Party, the Liberal Party, they have made, uh, they have been making promises after promises. Very, very expensive promises. We are, all, we are all already in so much debt. I don't know where they will get the money to fulfill those promises. Uh, the Liberal government have reduced unemployment by hiring more public service workers, and they really don't contribute anything to the economy. Uh, they take away from the economy because the good, the they're, good they're, money they're, that those people make the, the goes into the economy they, every they, single day. The taxes they pay is the money they earn from you and I. So they they are not contributing towards the economy because in the last mm -hmm. ten years. Ontario had no growth, economic growth, out of all the provinces Ram, in Ontario. Ram, I'm a public service worker, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I can tell you that uh, I shop in Barrie, I buy my clothes yeah. in Barrie. Yeah, but you're spending taxpayers' this. money. So how are you contributing to, and, towards the economy? And, and I'm, Ram, I'm Ram, a taxpayer, I, I do and I'm the one who contributes, because the money I point. make is from the private sector. Graham, I do agree with you on one point. We, we need to be honest about how we're going to pay for these promises. So I'm going to be honest with you. We're going to raise taxes on the wealthiest people in our province because they can afford to pay a little bit more. So we're going to penalize people for being rich and to be, to be successful. We're going to raise their taxes. Like if we are not being taxed it's enough It's not already. penalizing. What it's doing, the same as the NDP plan, is we're asking people that are making a little more in our society to, we're the to, second uh, to help us out we're, so we're, that we can find we're, a we're the, platform. We're the, we're the second highest tax jurisdiction in North America. We Say second that again, highest, Doug. Say second that again. highest tax jurisdiction in North America. Yeah, and we have the lowest corporate tax rate in North America besides mm -hmm. the United States, yeah. so we can afford to raise it by one point to pay for these important public services. Okay, so that is five minutes. The next topic for our candidates concerns jobs and trade. And the panelist for this question is Ray, Raymond Bowes. Each candidate will have 45 seconds to answer this question in the following order. Mr. Roskam, Mr. Kirk, Mr. Downey, Mr. Jansen, Mr. Elwin, Mr. F Mr. Farber. Uh, Mr. Bowes, your question. Uh, just quickly, uh, for the short answers, how would you go about creating jobs that aren't just minimum wage positions? Mr. Roskam. How do you go to, so I guess that's the question that really, well, how do you create the good jobs? That reminds me when, uh, what was it, 20, 
2006 and Rob Hamilton campaigned upon uh, for mayor. It's like, you know, Barry wants the good jobs. And I thought to myself, well, what makes Barry special? I mean, he did bring some. I mean, it's an admirable thing to do. It's just that everybody wants those good jobs. And uh, returning to the party platform, which I represent along with the three R's of, you know, direct democracy, which is uh, referendum, recall, and reform, that uh, the more that you relieve people of debt and the $12 billion of interest that has to be paid every year to service the debt alone, that frees up a lot more money into the marketplace itself, and that's where all that prosperity will naturally take place. So Thank it's you. the debt devil again. Thank you. Mr. Kirk. Our education system has uh, received lots of investments from the Liberal government, and through that we've been able to raise our school graduation rates up 18% over the 15 years. How do you create good jobs? You educate our society to uh, get the skills that are in demand today. Again, I talked about innovative automations. They are creating lots of jobs here in the Barrie area, and this is a partnership between Georgian College and innovative automations. These are good full-time, stable jobs right here in our community, and it's because of the Liberal Party's investment in education that we got there. Thank you. Mr. Downey. You have to set the stage for businesses to want to reinvest, to be able to reinvest. Most economic growth and expansion comes from existing businesses, and right now they're scared, or they're closing, or they're under stress, and we need to adjust tax rates, we need to adjust input costs, that's everything from, from hydro to uh, payroll taxes to all those things that, that other parties don't call taxes but are licenses and fees and whatnot. We, we have to get all of those things under control so the businesses are comfortable moving forward. Mr. Jensen. Well, uh, the NDP plan is the plan for the future. And what it's doing is it's making sure that uh, people can go to school, they uh, can have free education through grants, and uh, if you're already going to school and you've got, uh, got uh, grants there, there's interest for you to, to pay off that school a lot easier. Uh, so making it easier for people to get an education, to get into those well-paying jobs, as well as creating apprenticeship programs uh, so that uh, we can get people into the skills trade, trades. Another thing I'd like to say is that uh, when, when uh, businesses play their workers well, invest in training, uh, you have a lot lower of a turnover, which decreases uh, training costs, as well as uh, more productivity in the workplace. Mr. Aylwin. You know, I, I'm a bit worried this election because we have three status quo parties clinging to this idea of an old economy. But we need to be leaping into the 21st century and investing in the clean economy. It's a $6 trillion opportunity worldwide. And if we even capture 1% of that, that would be huge for our economy. So we need to be investing in those good paying, local manufacturing jobs. And I don't want to see us miss out on that. So we need to invest now so that we can have those jobs right here in our community. Thank you. Mr. Fairburn. Uh, the Liberals have spent a lot of money on education. It doesn't work. Um, and it, it shows. It doesn't work. We need to go back to common sense approach in our schools. We, uh, we need to educate our children better than it's happening right now from a very young age. Uh, students are leaving high school or colleges and can't find jobs because they're not qualified even though they have finished the courses there are a lot of students in high school right now who really don't want to be there so i would give students at the age at uh, when they finish grade 10 an opportunity to go and learn a trade we need to build a trade school in simcoe county thank you thank you it is now time for our five minutes of open debate, beginning with a question from Mr. Bose. Uh, just with so much growth happening in the Barrie area, what can be done to create more well-paying jobs locally to have new residents working closer to home? Well, we, we have to match the, the skills training with the jobs available. We're talking to, whether you talk to Innovative, if, as you were talking about, or Napoleon or any of the others, there's, there's a need for skilled but Doug, Doug, I'm concerned about your plan because it, it, there's an eight billion dollar gap, and I think you're no, going I, to I pay think, for that. No, I think you mean the, I think you services. mean the seven billion in the NDP or the six billion in your last budget. All right. Well, the question was about jobs. So, how do we create jobs 
locally. And I think we need to support our small businesses because more than 70% of our jobs in Ontario are with small businesses. And I'm worried because we have two parties of big business, the Liberals and the Conservatives, and one party of no business. Keenan, Keenan what's a big business? And, is, and, is, is Napoleon and, a big business? Is Napoleon a big business? Uh, no, it's a small local business. Like I said, we need to support our small local businesses. So and I'm worried Honda about the maybe? NDP's so plan. So Honda, should we abandon Honda and, and, and just like... Absolutely not, but we need well, to pay how, more how, attention to the small businesses because they create 70% of our jobs. The and I'm concerned plan? about the NDP plan because they're proposing raising taxes, payroll taxes, on small businesses. So I didn't see that, Keenan, but... Uh, maybe you should read your platform, but... Dan, I'm sorry. <laughs> there are a lot of jobs in Barrie. But people really don't want to come here to work. It's too ex the cost of living in Barrie is too high. They could get the same job, make more money somewhere else, and the cost of living is a lot lower. So what we need to do in Barrie is to somehow uh, help the businesses reduce their taxes, uh, give them opportunity to, to subsidize some of these jobs, subsidize housing, subsidize health care in order for people to come here and make the same money and live for less. The NDP plan is not the plan of no business. The NDP plan is a plan that lifts people up out of poverty. It lifts people up and levels the playing field. And it'll, it will allow people to spend that money into our economy and that will allow our economy to thrive. That doesn't hurt small businesses. Yeah, so um, investment in, uh, in infrastructure, we're, we plan on spending $180 billion on infrastructure spending. And uh, we'll have a pro procurement plan that will make sure that 33% of all that spending is given to small businesses within the communities that they're built uh, through creating community benefit networks. I've experienced creating, uh, uh, working on creating one of these uh, community benefit networks at Toronto Pearson International Airport with the new transit hub. That makes sure that workers from the area get jobs, it means businesses from the area uh, get the work, and uh, that money is coming to our local economy. So the government's, role, the government's role in reducing the small business tax rate from 4.5 to 3.5% for having the lowest corporate tax rate in all of Canada has helped businesses reinvest in their people, but that's not enough. We've also invested in education and that is the skills trade, the high paying, the good quality jobs that we need right here in Barrie, Springwater, or Medante. And our plan's working. Look at what's going on here in Barrie. There are some great jobs coming to town, and these are skilled trades right here from Georgian College. We, we, we know that we need more skilled trades, but the alignment isn't quite right. There's a shortage of welders, there's a shortage of a number of trades, and we need to get, need to get the colleges uh, it, able to fulfill some of those needs. Yeah, and you're right, Doug, we need, we need to invest in the clean economy. Right now we spend $3.1 billion on business support programs and we don't even know how they're working. So if we reinvest that in the clean economy, we can leap into the 21st century and create those good paying jobs, not just temporary, part-time, low-wage jobs. Anybody else? Uh, one <laughs> going once, going twice. All right. How's the audience doing? <laughs> doing good? Awesome. So we'll move on. So the next topic for our candidates concerns red tape, regulation, and policy. And the panelist for this question is Greg Grohn. Each candidate will have 45 seconds to answer this question in the following order. Mr. Elwin, Mr. Roskam, Mr. Downey, Mr. Jansen, Mr. Kirk, Mr. Faber. Mr. Grohn, can I have your question, please? Yeah, the end of that conversation is actually an excellent lead into the next question, so I'm really glad it went that direction. So basically my question is that some businesses will be more able to service a regional procure, pure procurement contract more easily than a province-wide procurement contract. Will your party consider offering regional procurement opportunities and therefore open the door for small businesses in the various quadrants of the province to bid? Mr. Elwin. Absolutely. We, we need to be prioritizing our small local businesses um, rather than big business where the, the profits just leave our communities, leave our province, um, and we don't see the benefits. So absolutely. Thank you for the question. Mr. Roskam. Well, there are, as of uh, four years ago, 909 tax forms applicable to the residents of Ontario, and that's a statement and answer, rather, from the Canadian Revenue Agency. 
And so in regards to uh, helping uh, small businesses begin to flourish, I don't believe that the government of Ontario should be <laughs> the only drug pusher we got for weed. If they can <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, as long as it's taxed, you know, let, let anybody sell, uh, set up shop. It shouldn't have like the exclusive market uh, to itself. So that's all I can address in 45 seconds. Mr. Downey. So in terms of the, your question, it's really about can we give preference to somebody locally? And municipalities wrestle with that a lot. And they've developed some scoring systems when they're doing procurement about trustworthiness, a track record, that kind of thing. So indirectly, they're trying to do that. Am I in favor of shop local? Absolutely. I shop local all the time. I source local. And I think uh, people should be encouraged to do that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Mr. Jensen. Uh, yes, definitely. I just spoke about that uh, and the infrastructure spending that the NDP does plan on giving 33% of the business to uh, small, small, medium, local businesses that, uh, so that the community where the infrastructure project is being built uh, benefits. Mr. Kirk. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to uh, echo what Dan and uh, what Doug have said. Uh, in the criteria for selecting the uh, proponent, the successful proponent, is where you will find a uh, weighting that can be applied to uh, the local region. And so it really depends on what it is that you're purchasing. But if it were uh, you know, an item like building roads, uh, then yes, uh, you could include a section that provided a percentage of that overall scoring to that section. And so people aren't just losing out on, on wages and they're not losing out on the price of the actual uh, item. They can compete by being local, and I support local. Thank you. Mr. Fairburn. All businesses are in, the, are in it to make money. Uh, the larger businesses have uh, a, lot of more, a lot of cash flow and have the ability to charge less than a smaller business. In order for a, for a small business to compete, uh, they need funds and they need to hire more people or have more uh, machinery or equipment to do that. And they really can't afford it. So even you want to give smaller businesses a chance, they wouldn't be able to handle it. Thank you. It is now time for our final five minute open debate, uh, beginning again uh, with a question from Mr. Groom. Uh, so there's a growing concern in our community about an increased rural and urban divide and the different needs of each area. As this riding is both urban and rural, how will you ensure that both have equal opportunities for growth? Well, let, let's start with some, some facts. In the 300,000 manufacturing jobs that we've lost, the net gain of jobs, 99% have been in Ottawa and Toronto. So we, we, have, a, we have a big challenge uh, in terms of, of putting jobs on the ground back here. And we have lifestyle to sell. We have a fantastic lifestyle to sell here. And it's only 10 minutes that way. So I, I think that we, we need to have the services available, but we don't have to change the lifestyle that's available. Uh, people can choose. Barry has a very diverse range of, of opportunities. I, uh, I, I think that we have to support it with infrastructure, whether it be uh, transportation or, or water, wastewater, and all of those things, so that there's a quality of life. Um, but Beyond that, I, I don't think that, that it's an insurmountable challenge at all. Yeah, and I, I'd have to agree with Doug on that. Um, and also echo, we have to invest in digital infrastructure in terms of broadband internet Absolutely. for rural communities. Um, and we, uh, back to the regional procurement, you know, with the Clean Energy Act, the Liberals prioritized big corporate companies like Samsung, and we should have been prioritizing small local businesses and community ownership because you know that's why the clean energy file was so so messy and we got a lot of flack as the green party for for standing up against the clean energy act but it's because the liberals they they just prioritized corporate ownership and corporate profit over over our communities and i don't think that's right well and they actually ignored their own experts and it's cost us billions of dollars if, uh, if Barry succeed, Oramadan to spring water will. Uh, what I would suggest is we need something to attract tourists in Barry. What we need in the Barry downtown is a small luxury hotel, which uh, caters for strictly tourism and send the word around the world that come to Barry. Uh, we have the waterfront, we have the beaches, we have beautiful places in Oramadante, Springwater, uh, where people can come, 
and spend their money and grow the economy in this riding. One of the amazing things about running in this election has been the opportunity to learn so much about our community. And you're right, there is a lot of different issues when it comes to our, uh, our urban uh, and, and rural issues. Um, expanding the green belt and looking at the green belt expansion. It's something that uh, uh, has been a touchy subject throughout the campaign. Uh, there's some uh, there's people on both sides of the issue, but ultimately there's a lot of people that uh, that uh, want to protect the environment in our community, and that uh, doesn't it doesn't have a divide. That's uh, within the city of Barrie and uh, 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 in Springwater and uh, in Oro Medante. So when you expand the green belt, when you add protections to our environment. You create a society where people want to be, where people want to come, where people want to flourish. I realize that urban and uh, rural areas have different economic um, inputs. And so I'm supportive of the Liberal Party's plan to continue to invest in Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund to help with roads, with bridges, because they don't have the population to uh, do all of that work themselves. And uh, creating a, uh, an environment where people want to be means people will be there. And protecting our environment is a huge component of that. Yeah. So what, what we're talking about here so far is about building homes and development. But nobody's talking about the farmers. And the farmers are feeling, they're feeling on the outside of the tent. They're feeling beat down. They're, they're, they're being micromanaged by the current government. And, and the, the rules and regulations, they are stewards of land. And they know how to steward their land. And they're not being respected. And I think in terms of that ur urban-rural divide, we need to, to come to terms with that as yeah, well. Absolutely, Doug. I'll agree 100%. Farmers are the stewards of the land, and our farm we're losing a lot of farmland every year, so we need to protect that farmland. But we need to compensate farmers for the work that they're already doing. So we need an actual plan to help those farmers who are already doing this great work in our communities. Yep. The NDP is talking about a local food strategy to make sure that, uh, that farmers have the ability to get to the food to the, of uh, the plates of families in the local communities. It's because called the Local the Food Investment Fund and it's provided by the Greenbelt Fund right now. It exists, it's, it's working, and it's helping provide healthy, local, grown produce to people here in this room. So the one thing in our plan, Kenan, that you would like, I'm happy to share with you, is the rural uh, the risk management fund. We, we're proposing to increase that fund. Uh, it, it was introduced by the Liberals, which was actually a good idea. Um, and, but they capped it at $100 million, which is not very much when you talk about risk management. It's going up uh, to $230 million. That's I, know, I know money's no object Where's at this point. Where's the money going to be coming okay. from? Okay, <laughs> so that is five minutes. So that completes our series of topic questions and the open debate for this evening. Uh, between yesterday's debate in the Barry Innisfil riding and today's, that is eight five-minute uh, open debates that I've got through, and I didn't have to tackle anybody <laughs> across that 40 minutes. So thank you all. Uh, we will now read audience questions. We are into that part of the program where we are under time pressure. We also need to allow time at the end for closing remarks for each of the candidates. So I would ask that each of the candidates, uh, in their response, confine their remarks to 45 seconds or less. This will allow us to ask as many of the audience questions as possible. As before, the order for the candidates' responses was determined by random draw prior to the debate. It is 7 o'clock now. I'm going to end the uh, questions from the audience at 7.45 as a way of ensuring that we have time uh, at the end for final remarks. So at this point, I will hand this over to Matthew, and can I have your first question from the audience? Thank you. Uh, good evening, candidates. Thank you for participating in tonight's events, and I will be asking questions tonight from our audience. First question will be or answered in the order of Mr. Keenan Alwyn, Mr. Jeff Kirk, Mr. Dan Jansen, Mr. Doug Downey, Mr. Ram Faber, and Mr. Darren Rossman. How does your party intend to fund initiatives proposed in your platform? Mr. Allen. Yeah, so as I said, we have a fully costed platform. Under each item in our platform, we tell you exactly how we're going to pay for things, but also where that money is coming from. So gpo.ca slash platform. And, you know, as I said before, we need to 
raise additional revenue. So one of the other ways we can do it is by increasing our resource uh, royalty rate, which is the lowest in the country. So we want to increase it to the level of Saskatchewan, and that raises a billion dollars per year. So that's just one of the creative ways to raise additional revenue and pay for some of our promises. Thank you. Mr. Kirk. Uh, the Liberal plan is going to increase taxes on those that uh, uh, earn a lot of money. Uh, we're also going to be running a deficit until 2024, and we're going to be applying all of the surpluses that we have within the fiscal year to paying down the province's debt. We are doing this because we have heard from families that they need additional help, additional supports, like free prescriptions, free tuition, and free um, uh, preschool. Thank you. Mr. Jansen. Yeah, our uh, plan, to fund our plan, we're uh, planning on raising uh, corporate taxes by 1.5% and raising uh, taxes on uh, households that are making 220000 and, and 300000 by 1% and 2%. It's not a huge increase to ask uh, for people to, uh, to um, uh, help us get this social platform off the ground. We're also looking at a foreign buyer's tax for, uh, for housing so that we can keep our housing costs under control and also uh, uh, bring in some revenue if people are uh, deciding to purchase a, a house and live abroad. Um, we're also looking at um, uh, raising taxes on vehicles that are uh, a surcharge on vehicles that are $90,000 and over. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Downey. First of all, the, the, the credit card is maxed out, so we have to go looking internally. The Auditor General found a billion dollars per year in 14 agencies, only 14 agencies. We know that there are savings to be had and nobody lost a job. No service level went down. So we need to get in there and we need to do, uh, expand the tools of the Auditor General, bring in some outside auditors and find four cents on the dollar. If you had to find four cents on the dollar in your house, you could do it without affecting your lifestyle, nobody will lose a job, no service level will go down. Thank you. Mr. Ferber. I will consult with the people of Berry Spring Water or Medante and try to do the little, thing, the, the little things that matters the most, which would be less effective and we will get a lot more done rather than making all these big promises with very, very high costs. I guarantee you none of it will get done. But the little things that we will do in, this, in the writing will sure get done and be very effective. Thank you. Mr. Rouskam. In regards to the libertarian style uh, of platform, which I'm still allowed to offer you, I would do away with things that we can live without, like TV Ontario, the Ministries of Tourism, Culture and Sport, uh, the Trillium Grant Fund. And if you think that's too much, and if you think that you know, you've heard the same sober, careful promises from the three big shots for decades before, just take a look at the over $300 billion debt we have, the $12 billion in interest service per annum alone, and think to yourself, none of the above. Thank you. The next order of questions will be answered by Mr. Jansen first, then Mr. Roskam, Mr. Farber, Mr. Alwyn, Mr. Kirk, and last, Mr. Downey. Will your party support employees taking priority over all other creditors in case of employers entering court protection or declaring bankruptcy in the form of workers' wages, severance payments, and health benefits? Mr. Jansen. Uh, the answer is a definite yes. Uh, when Sears workers lost their jobs, uh, they were at the back of the line when it came to uh, uh, creditor protection. And uh, many, of them, uh, many of them only got to benefit through uh, the, the Liberal government. I'll give them that credit. The NDP plan is to double that uh, to $3,000 uh, uh, per month so that the seniors can live in dignity and can live, uh, uh, put food on the table. Um, the other thing is at the federal level, uh, MP Scott Duval, NDP, NDP MP, is, uh, has been fighting uh, to change the legislation to make sure that uh, creditors uh, pensioners are the very first creditors in terms of a bankruptcy. Mr. Roskam? Well, you know, most people want to spend their money and enjoy life, and uh, if there's a suitable business offering a product or service which is going under, even if it is Sears, it's because people don't have the money that they should have to uh, enjoy patronizing those products and services. So it's a sad situation all around, yet 
even if it sounds mean, I would put the creditors first because without their investment, there wouldn't be a job to be had anyway. Thank you. Mr. Farber. I would look into what could be done for the best interest of both parties. I mean, if there is something that could be worked out, we will work it out. Sometimes there's no solutions. Companies just goes bankrupt. They have nothing to offer to their employers. It's just the way things are sometimes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Alwyn. So we need to look at building a safety net for, for people in times of transition, um, times of crisis. So what the Green Party of Ontario is proposing is a basic income guarantee. And I'll give the Liberals credit. They, they started a pilot project here in Ontario, and it's, it's working. Uh, we show, it shows that health care costs drop. Uh, the the uh, amount of people going into our justice system drops. So that saves us money as taxpayers, but it also helps the most vulnerable in our communities. So a basic income guarantee is a way that we can end poverty now and also save money as taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Kirk. So the Liberal Party has a track record of protecting consumers and protecting uh, workers. The uh, Liberal government has a Protecting Condominium Owners Act, and we have a Wireless Agreement Act. We're talking about bankruptcy and, and insolvency, and that's a, a federal jurisdiction, something that the federal government oversees. Uh, am I supportive of protecting the worker? Absolutely, 100%. I think that the way in protecting them is through social safety nets that uh, Keenan was kind enough to talk about in my 30 seconds. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Downey. Pension funds are, are trust funds for people who paid into them, and, and they, they have a right to them, but it is a federal jurisdiction, and it's a discussion we would have to start with the feds, but it really isn't our jurisdiction, and unfortunately, that's the answer. Thank you. The next order of questions will be answered by Mr. Alwyn, Mr. Downey, Mr. Jansen, Mr. Farber, Mr. Kirk, and then Mr. Roscombe. How would you balance the need for new housing developments and related infrastructure while maintain, maintaining the county's distinct regions? Mr. Alwyn. Absolutely. So this is a, an issue we've been working on for months. I've been going door to door since September, getting signatures on a petition to unlock housing because Barrie is in a housing crisis. Our homeless shelters were full over the winter and they were turning people away. And that is unacceptable. That is unacceptable. So we need the government to take action now. So we're proposing mandating 20% affordable units for all new developments and investing in social and co-op housing and exploring creative solutions like laneway housing, tiny homes to end the housing crisis because you know I'm disappointed in the Liberal government in their last budget. They didn't even mention the words affordable housing once. So 20% affordable units in all new developments is a low cost way to build more affordable housing stock. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Downey. I, I'm one of 24 certified specialists in real estate in Ontario, and so I deal with real estate and development uh, for, for buyers, for homeowners, for, for regular normal people. What, the, what we have to do is go back to what the smart growth that started back in 2000, early 2000s. The Liberals have deviated from the original principles and the original plans. And that's having an impact on us. Housing supports, absolutely, that's part of our 1.9 billion over, over 10 years. Uh, that's part of our youth mental health and, and whatnot. Um, so we do have to do more, but we have to take a second look at how we got to where we are because the growth pressures and how they're being uh, dealt with are not necessarily fitting with, with our lifestyle. Thank you. Mr. Jansen. Uh, for the NDP, it's about uh, finding that balance, making sure that we are uh, building our communities in a way that are sustainable. Uh, we're also looking at uh, having uh, laneway, allowing municipalities to uh, to have laneway houses, granny suites, um, so that uh, we can create more spaces and more units within our uh, our existing communities. We're also signing on to the federal housing strategy uh, right away, so that we can get uh, as many units on, on as possible. Um, and in our affordable housing plan, uh, we're talking about uh, building uh, cooperative units uh, and um, not-for-profit units as well. Thank you. Mr. Farber. Everyone talks about affordable housing, but they don't understand it is a small part of a bigger picture that is affordable living. 
It is, it's not about wages, it's about taxes, and blindly overtaxing on the three level of government is the most terrifying problem we face in this country. Uh, landlords need to make money, and it doesn't matter how many housing you build, if, uh, if, and it doesn't matter how much money you're making, if at the end of the day you can't pay your rent and have money left to buy other necess necessities, it still, it still come under the, you're not being able to afford it. Your cost of living is too high. If at the end of the day you, you spend the money on the grocery and the food you need and you can't pay your rent, regardless of how much rent you have to pay, you Thank still you. can't afford it. Thank you. Mr. Kirk. So a strong housing market is a sign of the strong Ontario economy that we live in, but uh, there are people who cannot afford housing. There are developments that are not being developed. And so the Liberal Party has introduced the Fair Housing Plan. And that housing plan is going to help um, and has helped reduce the cost of home ownership. I've talked with a number of real estate agents in the area and the market has cooled. We are also investing to uh, incentivize developers to build affordable units. Right here in Barrie, we invested $1.5 million to help create affordable housing units. Is it enough? No, we need to keep moving forward. Thank you. Mr. Roscom. So the question is affordable housing and uh, like myself, I'm 50, Keenan's 24. So like he's a generation back, I'm two generations back. Even before I was born, people were demanding affordable housing and it hasn't been fixed. It, it leads me to believe how can the, the world's governments on a federal level fail to take care of people who are starving to death in the third world? The, the, the question of this type comes up once every four years. It doesn't get met and then people move forward and forget about it. I don't have too much faith in the big shot parties or the Greens in being able to take care of this problem once and for all. So none of the above. Thank you. Uh, the next question will be order, answered in the order of Mr. Jansen, Mr. Farber, Mr. Downey, Mr. Roscom, Mr. Kirk, and Mr. Alwyn. What will each of your parties do for the price of gas? Mr. Jansen. I'm not too sure what our party's uh, doing exactly for the price of gas, but uh, uh, from the revenue that's uh, created by gas, uh, that's where the tax money is going back into the municipalities. Thank you, Mr. Farber. I'll, I'll get the Green Party to take the hands out, uh, take their, uh, take the money out of, of the, they're the one who really cause gas prices to go up. Uh, I mean, with the carbon taxes. Uh, five, you know, three cents on the carbon taxes, and then you have the en uh, environment taxes, and you have all these taxes implemented by the Green Party. Uh, taxes are, is a huge problem to every citizen and everyone that have a vehicle. Uh, for me, uh, the price of, of processing material goes down when price goes up, which means I'm making less money, and it happens to every citizen in this country. Thank you. Mr. Downey? Our policy is clear. We're moving gas down 10 cents per litre. And we're also not doing the cap and trade, which is sending money out of the province and actually not accomplishing anything. It's not doing anything for the environment except driving up the cost of fuel, which some NDP candidates think is a great thing. They want to get it way up there so you don't drive your car anymore. Thank you. Mr. Roscom? It's, it's a beautiful question. I mean, it's... it's you know, you, 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 <laughs> I love it you guys laugh. The government's going to fix everything for you, isn't it? Isn't it, right? It's just, certainly it's done so over the years, right? You can't take responsibility for your own lives. Ha, ha, ha. They're not laughing back now. I don't see how any of them are going to successfully rate uh, lower and keep lowering the price of gas. There's too many forces at work already to keep it where it is. You could be a little bit more economic within the scope of your own life and don't drive your living room on the road, or maybe get a scooter like I've got. Take responsibility. Thank you, Mr. Kirk. Uh, so gas prices are set by uh, corporations who uh, run on a free market, and uh, the government, both federal, provincial, uh, add taxes, and those taxes go into the roads, the schools, the hospitals that we use. How am I going to lower uh, gas prices? I'm going to lower gas prices by telling people that there are, are alternatives. Alternatives like the GO station, that's right here in Barrie. Alternatives like investments in clean energy. 
You can reduce the price of your house uh, through um, adding insulation, uh, new windows. And it is through these initiatives that we see real change. You take 10 cents off the leader, what's gonna happen in five years when the uh, markets that be increase prices? What's Thank going you. to happen? Thank You're you. gonna pay more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Owen. So, so I'm worried because we have the tale of two Dougs, Doug Downey and Doug Ford, burying their heads in the sand. And really, you know, it scares me. They're, they're abandoning the people of Ontario by ignoring the climate crisis. And we can't ignore that problem. We just can't. So, so we need to have, you know, the cap and trade system with the Liberals, that money, we don't know what's happening to that money. It's not very transparent. So what we're proposing is a carbon fee and dividend so that we can get the carbon price high enough so that we can actually start to reduce carbon pollution. But if we're going to do that, we have to return the money to the people of Ontario so that they can afford things like gas or they can buy a bicycle or they can buy a transit pass or they can retrofit their home Thank you. to save money by saving energy. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. The order for the next question will be answered by Mr. Downey, Mr. Kirk, Mr. Farber, Mr. Jansen, Mr. Roscombe, and then Mr. Alwyn. The LHIN has warned the provincial government that in the next five years, the demand for PSW services to help keep people living safely in their homes will be at eight times more than the forecasted available PSWs in Simcoe County. There's been a freeze on new operation funding for 18 years and without new funding permitted, community social service agencies cannot attract and retain the PSWs needed to respond to the crisis. What will you do to seek desperately needed operating funds for community social service agencies like independent living services so they can work together to help resolve the health care crisis? Mr. Downey. I love this question because it points exactly to the, to the skills gap crisis. When we're going to build 15,000 long-term care beds to get elderly people out of the acute beds in the hospital, you have to have PSWs to actually service those people. And so it, it's a skills gap that we have and we have to coordinate with our colleges and with our universities to make sure that we're training the volumes of individuals that we have and treat them with a little more respect than they're getting now. Mr. Kirk. Uh, so I'm support, uh, my sister's a PSW. I'm supportive of regulating the in industry under the um, uh, Allied Health Professions Act. I'm supportive of offering uh, free or reduced tuition to people that are looking for a career as a PSW. I also believe that uh, people deserve more. I want to see uh, people that are utilizing PSW support get a minimum of four hours of care. And that means that these PSWs uh, will be in much more demand than they are now. And when you create this demand and you provide the infrastructure to have them succeed, uh, you're, you're going to have more of them. They're going to uh, be attracted to these programs and it's gonna be great. Thank you. Mr. Farber. There is a demand for PSW in this uh, region in Barry Springwater or Madanthi. But like I've said before, there are a lot of PSWs out there, but they're not coming to Simcoe County because the, the cost, like I said, the cost of living is too high. They get paid a lot more somewhere else and are able to live at a lower cost. Uh, there's another thing we can do to help that situation is long-term care bread, uh, beds in the hospital with, with long-term care patients. Could move, uh, we have a shortage of um, in the in the um, the nursing home, so and there's a lot of vacancies in the senior homes, and they provide the same service. So we can take some of these long-term care patients and put them in the senior homes. Thank you. They get the same service. Thank you, Mr. Jansen. Thank you, uh, Jeff. To hear you talk about four hours of long-term care, I think that's great. Uh, but the Liberals could have done it already. The NDP had a bill out there that was uh, proposing four hours of long-term care, and when the Liberals prorogued Parliament so they could read their new budget bill, it died on the order paper. That is unacceptable. The NDP uh, will uh, give four hours of care once we get elected, and we'll be investing in PSWs in the field so that it makes it a desirable career and attracts people to come to it. Uh, if you're getting paid fair wages and, uh, and, and you actually have the time to give people the care that they need, uh, people will want to come and help people. Thank you. Mr. Roscombe. 
Well, when you put forth the question, like, what would you do about it? I mean, who wouldn't want to apply more initiatives towards providing more PSWs to the people that, that need it? Because it, it's for no joke that they're asking for it. They need that extra care, and that uh, that request should be respected, especially for, for seniors who have invested into our society for decades and deserve extra care and should have it. Unfortunately, I'm going to return to the debt like a broken record, and it leaves you unable to make the moves that you would like to do. Maybe other people believe that in the coffers of the government, there's Richie Rich and Scrooge McDuck swimming around in a pool filled with millions of dollars. There's only two things back there, a desert and a banker stroking his beard saying, go borrow more money and interest. If I had money available, I would spend more on it. I just refuse to borrow more at interest. Sorry. Thank you. Mr. Alwyn. So the question was right. We're, we're in a healthcare crisis, and it's because we keep pouring money into a system that we need to rethink. Because right now, we only spend about 1% of our healthcare funding on prevention. Um, so we need a healthy living, uh, an active aging strategy, um, and we need to start investing in prevention so that we're not just treating sickness, we're actually promoting health. Thank you. Thank you. The order for the next question will be answered by Mr. Roscom. Mr. Jansen, Mr. Kirk, Mr. Downey, Mr. Alwyn, and Mr. Farber. We know that the first six years of a child's life is critical to well-being. How will your platform support our most vulnerable citizens and increase access to services such as quality child care and early intervention resources? Mr. Roscom. Well, that's another tough one, and I got it first. Uh, uh, if, if, if the seniors certainly deserve it, you know, uh, citizens when they're at their youngest and most vulnerable, and of course when both parents have to uh, fight to bring home a living wage, then uh, why wouldn't you want to invest uh, more money into it as they have in Quebec? I, I would love to if we would just get us out of debt. Like maybe, maybe I should approach it a different way. I'm not necessarily against, you know, spending on social things. Like I got the, a couple friends in the NDP, I said if we had more money, I wouldn't want, want to appear to be being so mean. If we had more money, I would probably want to have a referendum on it. And if everybody wanted it, then I would spend the money on it. I think that's fair enough. Thank you. Mr. Jansen. Yep, the NDP uh, supports uh, a child care plan that uh, is $12 a day and free for families uh, making only $40,000 a year. I was at the YMCA this morning and uh, they talked about the gap in, uh, in wages for uh, ECEs that are, uh, that are working in child care spaces uh, compared to uh, when they go into JK or kindergarten. Um, so our plan is to invest in the field of ECEs, again, just like the PSWs, to make sure that it is a desirable, uh, a desirable career option to go to something they can uh, afford to live on. Uh, the, uh, the child care spaces that we plan on building are uh, uh, 202,000 not-for-profit spaces, and we're looking at uh, putting them in locations that already exist. Thank you. Mr. Kirk. Uh, so the Liberal Party is looking to provide a free preschool for everyone in Ontario. This is an uh, equitable access. This isn't a tax incentive for the rich. We've already provided full-day full day kindergarten, and uh, we've seen the benefits of this program. People are making choices, and these choices are allowing them to contribute to the economy. And when you support those who need it most, we all get to move forward together. Thank you. Mr. Downey. The Liberal and the, and the NDP parties are wanting to invest in institutional care. We want to invest in parents. We want to put parents back in charge of their child care. We will have a tax credit for up to three quarters of what you spend, $6,750 per child per year, whether it be private babysitter, a retired teacher next door, or wherever they choose to do it, 24-7, 365 a year. And when I talk to people up in Elmvale, even if you did institutional care, it doesn't exist up there. So we're putting parents back in charge. Thank you. Mr. Alwyn. So I think we do need to move toward a Quebec-style child care system, absolutely. But the, the question was also about, you know, protecting the most vulnerable people in our society, and uh, especially children. So we have 12,000 children on the waiting list for mental health services right now in Ontario. And that's, that is just so wrong. So I think we need to invest and make mental health services part of OHIP. And you know, that, the, the cost of mental health and not treating it, it costs all of us because people end up in the hospital. They end up in jail. And you know, that's just not right. We should be providing the services in the community. 
where it's needed. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Farber? Governments have already provided a lot towards uh, people having children or towards children. They provide health care, they provide education, they provide transportation, uh, they provide a child tax credit, which the federal government gives a lot of money. And if you cannot, if you cannot provide for your children, you shouldn't be having them. You should, not, you should not depend on government to take care of your children. I have four children myself, and none of them have gone to daycare, and I haven't got any money, or we, my, my kids have grown up, and things are good. If we were living then, now, I wouldn't have asked for anything Thank you. else. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will be order, answered in the order of Mr. Kirk, Mr. Farber, Mr. Roscom, Mr. Downey, Mr. Jansen, and Mr. Alwyn. Personal income taxes have not been reduced substantially in Ontario for some time. What will your party do to keep taxes low and or reduce them? Mr. Kirk. Uh, so we will be raising taxes on those that uh, earn a, a large income to help pay for uh, some of the programs and services that the people of Ontario need. Uh, so the plan for the personal income tax, those uh, making the, uh, the middle income bracket, is to keep it stable. Where we're reducing income tax, or sorry, reducing burdens on families, is through providing free prescriptions, free OHIP for those under 25, and if elected, those 65 and over, as part of the strategy to provide a universal prescription plan. We're also bringing in free preschool to help uh, people and uh, uh, reduce the burden. I've got a son in, in preschool right now, and it's $15,000 a year uh, for Thank him you. to go. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Farber. As we know, taxes are a problem, not only in, in the riding or in the province, but it's, it's a problem in the country. Especially with uh, what I would do to reduce taxes, especially with the minimum wage going up to $15 an hour or stay at $14 an hour, mm -hmm. is to to ask the government to not put uh, minimum wage workers into a higher tax bracket because of the little bit more money they're making. By doing this, it will allow them to take more money home mm -hmm. instead of going to a different tax bracket, pay more taxes. It really doesn't help the situation. So by doing this, they will have more money in their pockets and will be able to contribute more to the economy. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Roscom. Uh, I would I would love to uh, reduce income taxes. I mean, don't everybody enjoy lower taxes? Of course they would. It's just that we we do have an infrastructure of services that are are needed, and I don't want to you know be so mean as to say we're I got to cut away things that uh, I didn't like what Barry today said about me. He said I could slash and trash everything, and uh, Barry Advance was was fair to me though, and um, so the things that we do need would be sustained. And uh, the things like TV Ontario, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to see that come around for everybody, right? Where do you stand on TV Ontario? It's, it's just, those big issues are decided by the big shot parties and the mainstream media. And I never get to see the questions I'd like to address brought around. So I would do away with things that we can really live without to alleviate Thank you. taxes. Thank you. Mr. Downey? We would adjust the tax system so that those living on minimum wage do not pay tax. That's a start. And that's in... In, uh, to help them get by because the minimum wage is not going up January 1st. We're adjusting the band downward for the 40 to 80,000 range, uh, for income tax, and, and our childcare policy helps parents. Jeff, you'd get $6,750 back out of that 15,000. Thank you. Mr. Jansen. Uh, first, I just have to address the uh, lowering corporate or lowering the taxes for minimum wage workers. That's going to put uh, minimum wage workers out of money in their pockets. Uh, if they get an uh, increase uh, of a dollar, uh, they're actually going to have $1,200 extra in their pockets than uh, the plan that uh, Doug's proposing. Uh, we got to talk about taxes. Taxes, uh, they fund our society. They, they allow us to have hospitals to take care of us, uh, our community centers and our infrastructures. Uh, we may not be lowering our personal taxes, but we are offering pharmacare and dental, as well as, uh, as childcare. There's a lot of social programs in our, in our platform that go to helping families, uh, and that, uh, that will help take the burden off. Thank you. Mr. Alwyn. 
you know, what, what I like about these debates is where we can find, where we can find some common ground. And, um, you know, Doug's, Doug's plan about reducing, uh, eliminating income tax on minimum wage earners, I think is an idea worth exploring. Um, but also we can't use it as an excuse to help the most vulnerable in our society who uh, are maybe on social assistance, OW, ODSP, um, and those rates have not been increased. They haven't even kept in, in, in uh, with inflation, and that's not good enough. We can't keep people in poverty. We have to lift them out of poverty, and we're the only party that's calling for an immediate increase in those social assistance rates um, so that people can live a life of dignity. Thank you. This will be the last question. Thank you. The last question is, what is your party's platform? Oh, sorry. Let me get the order here. It's going to go Mr. Downey, Mr. Jansen, Mr. Alwyn, Mr. Farber, Mr. Kirk, and then last, Mr. Roscombe. What is your party's platform on trying to handle the skyrocketing hydro rates? We have a three-part plan. One is to take the dividends from the shares that we have left that the Liberals didn't sell off, have those dividends go back directly to the consumer instead of into general revenue. The second part is to, re to not sign any more fit contracts, the feed-in tariff, the solar, the wind. If we want to do green energy, we should be talking about water power. The third part is to take the, the green initiative fund and put it as a general policy piece and not on the hydro bill. That'll take us down 12%. Thank you. Mr. Jansen. As I said earlier, uh, hydro was sold off without our permission. Um, it's generations that I see in this room that uh, worked hard to pay taxes to build that infrastructure. Um, it was a short-sighted uh, short um, cash grab. And yes, as Jeff will explain, it, it did go to <coughs> funding some infrastructure projects. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, it, it, it caused prices to skyrocket. Uh, our plan is to bring it back into public hands. By using the dividends that, uh, that uh, each share pays, we'll use the dividends to purchase uh, um, the shares back so that it's, uh, that it's where it belongs, in public hands. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Owen? So the Green Party of Ontario is the only party that has the courage to stand up to the nuclear lobby, which is the most powerful lobby in this province. They spend millions of dollars every year advertising. And, you know, it's, it's not a sound environmental decision because we don't know what to do with the waste, but it's also not a sound economic decision because no nuclear project has ever come in on time or on budget, and the nuclear industry is asking for a 180% price increase. So if we think prices are bad now, imagine what 180% would do. So we need to cancel the, the Pickering nuclear refurbishment, and that saves $1.1 billion per year, and with that money, we can buy low-cost hydropower from Quebec, um, which they're already selling to other jurisdictions. And that's half the cost of what Pickering nuclear Thank power you. costs. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ferber. Well, the people and I are very spring water on Modanti. We will do whatever it takes to reduce hydro rates. Uh, the government would have been ahead by $1.8 billion if they haven't sold off hydro for infrastructure purposes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kirk? Investing in hydro infrastructure has provided Ontario with a clean, reliable energy system. We listened to the people of Ontario when they told us that hydro rates were getting out of control, and so we reduced these hydro rates by 25%. Part of the plan was through selling off uh, parts of hydro, 60%, and a lot of people are upset about that. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that plan because a number of people were, uh, were angry about it. But I'm not sorry about the investments that we've made in infrastructure in providing a clean, reliable energy system that we all rely on. If you defer investments like some governments, you have to pay the piper. And we did so in a clean way that we are all benefiting from. Thank you. Lastly, Mr. Roscombe. Yeah, I tried to speak to this earlier. I tried to shoehorn it into something else, and uh, I can adopt things as I see fit and uh, reject them uh, uh, the same way. So uh, just to remind you that, you know, what Doug Ford is offering, that makes sense to me. And even if he didn't achieve 12% reduction, if it was 10, that would still be, that, that would satisfy myself. And I just want to remind you uh, that the libertarian one, that's one of the problems I had with, uh, for those of you that were considering libertarian, none of the above, they're promising like 50%, which is crazy talk, ridiculous. And I'm glad I'm not representing that portion. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you, candidates. We will now hear the closing remarks from each candidate. 
they will have up to two minutes for their closing comments. As with the opening remarks and all questions tonight, the order for closing speeches was determined by a draw, and that order is Dan Jansen from the Ontario New Democratic Party, Darren Roskam from the None of the Above Direct Democracy Party, Doug Downey from the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party, Jeff Kirk from the Ontario Liberal Party, Ram Fairbert, who is running as an independent, and Keenan Alwyn, who is running from the Green Party of Ontario. Mr. Jansen, can I have your two minutes closing remarks, please? Thank you. As I said earlier, I'm very proud to be running under the NDP platform, as well as to be running with Andrew Horvath to become the Premier of our province. Uh, the NDP has put forward a bold plan to help everybody in our society. We're bringing our public institutions back into public hands and protecting our public services. We've got many social programs, and we're, we've got a platform that'll make sure that people succeed. The Liberals have been in power for 15 years, and we've seen what they've done. They're, they're trying to tell us that their progressive plan is something that, can, that uh, will, will help us out now. But I think it's too little too late. The PCs, we don't know what their plan is. They haven't shown it to us. Uh, they've given out piece works of what they're going to do, and it really doesn't add up. I've been going door to door in this riding for, uh, for quite some time now, uh, since the campaign started, and I'm hearing over and over again, voters that cannot trust Doug Ford to be the next premier of our province, and they're coming our way. I ask that you support me as well and, uh, to be your candidate uh, in the, as a MPP at Queen's Park. Um, I will bring your voice to Queen's Park, and I will be a strong voice for this community. Thank you. Mr. Roskam. To the uh, libertarians out there in TV land, I want to remind you that it was myself, my blood, sweat and tears that raised up the vote in the last election to 400. It's not a lot, it's still what I can claim to be is mine and my work. The libertarian candidate for this riding is not here, doesn't care. So uh, I want you to keep that in mind and follow me over to uh, none of the above because it gives me the opportunity to speak to those things and also offer you direct democracy. Uh, which is reform, referendum, and recall. So it's the best of both worlds, really. And uh, for those of you at home who have had enough of the big three parties, they always promise you everything, you can't trust any of them, you might throw a bone to the Greens for their effort. And, you know, they've already received... Like, they've already received your, your, your money as a tax subsidy along with the three big parties. Doug Ford wants to get rid of that subsidy, so do I. So you can't treat the children differently. You know, you've already given the Greens the president of your tax subsidy, you should give something my way. So I've got a song for you. It's something nice to say about Doug Ford. <laughs> Kathleen, she lied plenty. And Patrick Brown, he lied more. I like Andrea just fine. Even better, I like Doug Ford. And if there's one thing that I really love It's my own little party None of the above Mr. Downey, two minutes. That's going to be hard to follow. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for coming, and I want to thank Rogers for covering this. It's important that we all get our message out, and I want to thank my fellow candidates. It's been a respectful race all the way through, and so thank you. And thank you to the Chambers for hosting us and allowing us to, to uh, get our message out directly. This is an important election. This is a very, very important election. Life has been hard under this government. People are tired, and they're frustrated, and they want change. I believe we have the team to bring that change. The NDP have challenges within their star candidates. The Liberals, we've seen what the team has done. We have the, we have the talent, we have the experience, and we have the plan to make good change for Ontario. We need to clean up the hydro mess. We need to support our businesses and not just assume they're gonna survive. They're not surviving. We need to support them. I will be a strong voice for this riding, and I will be a strong voice to the residents and the small businesses. We need to get back to work in Barry Springwater or Medante. 
I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. Mr. Kirk, two minutes. I'd like to thank the Chamber and my fellow candidates for being here tonight. These were some great conversations. Uh, I think that it's clear that the Liberal plan is the best plan for the people of Ontario and our families. Things in Kathleen Wynne's Ontario haven't been perfect. Kathleen Wynne isn't sorry, and I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry about our investments in transit and clean energy. I'm not sorry that you can get home to your loved ones faster. I'm not sorry that we reduced the small business tax rate from 4.5% to 3.5%, and that unemployment is the lowest that it has been in almost 20 years. I'm not sorry about the Liberal Party's investments in cardiac and pediatric care right here in Barrie. And I'm really not sorry that we're investing in free childcare, free tuition, and free prescription drugs for all families in Ontario. Sorry, not sorry. Thank you. Mr. Fairbird, two minutes. I have a message for, for the people of Ontario. Don't vote for the NDP party. Don't vote for the Green party. Vote for the PC party. <laughs> but in my riding, Barry Springwater Ramadante, sorry, Doug, <laughs> vote for me. We're so close. Vote for, vote for me. My wife and I have worked very hard to raise our four children and are helping out with our two grandchildren. It was not easy, and now we are hearing from everyone, more and more, working or not working, how difficult it is to make ends meet. We are feeling it too, especially with the constant increase in the cost of living. There is no time to catch up. People are worried. I'm worried about the huge debt and deficit in Ontario, high gas prices at the pump, high taxes, climate climbing interest rate, high prices of food and services, low wages, smaller bottom line for businesses, and especially worrisome watching my, grand my, my daughter and her boyfriend working two jobs to pay $1,300 per month rent for a small basement bedroom apartment in Barrie. None of the candidates are in it for the people. They are in it for as a job and to make a career out of it. Their campaign expenses are paid by their respective parties, and if elected, will have to follow their party policy or risk being kicked out of the party. During the election, these candidates and the volunteers will come knocking on your doors, trying to get your votes, and after the election, you will never hear from them again. In my case, all expenses are paid for by me, and I have to continue to work. But if I'm elected as your MPP, only then I will come knocking on your doors to see how I can help or how we can help each other. The PC and the Liberal Thank candidate. you. Thanks. Mr. Elwin, two minutes. So, you, you may be asking yourself, why vote green? Does it count? Uh, can, can we even win? But, but the answer is yes. We've elected greens across the country, around the world, in BC, in PEI, in New Brunswick, and even Iceland has elected their first green prime minister. So, change is happening. And, and the time is now. But I'll be honest with you. We're not going to have a green government this time around. We're not. But what we can do is elect one or two or three greens. And this is one of the ridings where it's going to happen. So, you know, the big three status quo parties don't. They don't own your vote. Only you own your vote. So I'm asking you to vote for what you believe in. And I'm asking that you believe in me. Because together, we can win this. We can. I've been working for more than 300 days to earn your vote. And the other candidates have only been at it about just over a month. So I've been working hard to earn your trust, your respect, and your vote. Together, let's make history. Vote green. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. Thank you.
This brings this candidate's debate to a close. I would like to thank everyone who participated in this program. I would like to thank the Lion Gates Hall for hosting. Our panelists, Chris Simon with the Barry Advance, Ray Bowes from BarryToday.com, Greg Grohn, President of the Oromodonte Chamber of Commerce, and Patricia Dent, President of the Barry Chamber of Commerce. I'd also like to thank the Barry Chamber volunteer, Matthew Lund, and most importantly, the candidates for taking their time out of their very hectic schedules and canvassing to join us this evening. Um, I mentioned this at the Barry Innisfil riding as well, but it bears repeating here that you are only going to vote for one of these candidates. So only one of them is going to earn your vote. Uh, but all of them have, sh have earned your respect and they have earned your gratitude because democracy is hard and it's messy and it's difficult and it relies on individuals having the courage to put their name on a ballot and to put themselves forward to their community and present their ideas and present themselves and say, I, I want to represent you. And there is enormous courage that is required to do that. And so I personally would like to thank each and every one of the candidates for having that courage and for adding to our democracy and adding to our society by bringing their ideas and themselves forward. Our thanks to the... Our thanks to the many volunteers who helped behind the scenes to the Barry Chamber of Commerce, Rogers TV, and to you, our audience, both here on site as well as those watching at home. For those here who want to re-watch the, the, the debate, it will appear first at, uh, on Rogers TV on Saturday, June 2nd at 7 p.m., and then will be shown on repeat uh, between that time and an election day. So elections are important, and we should all get involved by casting our vote. We hope this event has helped you in some way with your decision. I wish all of the candidates best wishes. Please vote and good night. <laughs>